And then David will be finishing um, our series in Genesis for now next week. And then after that, we're going to be moving into the book of John for the, the summer and honestly, probably through the fall. Um, I mean, John's kind of big, so we don't want to rush through that. So that's where we're going to be at. Uh, before we jump into Genesis chapter 9, let me pray, uh, and then we'll, we'll get going here. Lord, thank you for this evening. Thank you for everyone you've brought here. Lord, we pray for the, the safety um, of those who are not here. Uh, we also ask that... Um, through hearing this, either here or online or wherever they're at, Lord, that you would quicken people's hearts, that you draw them to yourselves if they don't know you through the preaching of your word, Lord, and those that do know you, God, that you would admonish them and call them uh, to look and be more like your son. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen. Okay, so let's do a little bit of review here first. Um, so we have a good understanding of what's going on here at the end of chapter 9. So, obviously, the, the flood has ended. Uh, they have come off of the ark, Noah and his family. We saw last week how uh, they gave sacrifices to the Lord, how there was a covenant that got established with Noah. Uh, and this is where we see an important piece of Genesis, because this is like a, a transitionary text. And I'll talk about that more at the end. Okay, but this really is kind of bridging together um, the flood narrative with everything else that's going to happen after this. So that's really what's kind of going on here. So let's read through this text real quick. I'll talk about the points we want to look at, and then we'll walk through those together. So starting in verse 18, it says, The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Sham, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah. And from these, the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. By the way, apparently I'm aware that I say the word naked, kind of Texas-wise, so just bear with me this evening, as I probably say naked like a hundred times, okay? So, verse 24, when Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. And he also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let, the, and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So, we're going to be looking at three main points this evening in this text. So first is sin still reigned after the flood, and even righteous men fall. Secondly, we want to look at that sin has consequences. And thirdly, we want to look at the greater biblical narrative of this text. So first, sin still reigns, and even righteous men fall. To understand this, let's step back a little bit here and let's look, look at something interesting. Let, let's see how Noah is paralleled or compared to Adam. So look at verse 18. It says that he went forth from the ark. So what's happening here? Noah's emerging after the flood, after this recreation. We, we saw this as we walked through that. Victor talked about this a little bit. David talked about this, how there's this language where there's aspects of the creative story from Genesis 1 and 2 that are actually mimicked um, in the flood story. How the earth is being destroyed, it's being decreated, and then there's a recreation language used. And so in a sense, Noah is emerging from the ark in a new creation. Obviously the same world, 
Things have just been jumbled up a lot, right? It's a recreation, a new beginning. Secondly, verse 19, it says, From these, all the people of the whole earth were dispersed. So what do we see here? We see Noah is now also the father of the whole human race, just as Adam was. Thirdly, verse 20, um, and I'm not going to put all these up here because it would fill up the whole thing, but verse 20, Noah began to be a man of the soil. This is compares to Genesis 2.15. What does it tell us? Adam was commanded to work and keep the garden in Eden. Right? And then verse 21 tells us what happened with Noah. He became drunk. So we see that Noah falls as Adam fell. Verse 21 also, the second half, says that he lay uncovered in his tent. Just as Adam, after becoming aware of his nakedness, was afraid and hid himself. We see that in Genesis chapter 3. And then verse 23 here, Noah's nakedness is covered, ending his shame, just as clothing was provided for Adam and Eve. And so these are some interesting parallels, but what's the point? And this is the point. Mere men are not the ultimate saviors of mankind. And they never will be. Scripture presents these men like Noah, Moses, David. You can just go down the list. And it's as if they are kind of like the one. Like if you're reading through Scripture for the first time, you might kind of get this sense of like, hey, this, this person's like really important. Like, and if you're really paying attention, you remember all the way back in Genesis, it's like, hey, some important person or something important was promised to come from Eve. And so the idea would almost be like, is this the guy? But what do we see over and over? These men fall. Right? People will think, this, this is the guy that's going to make everything right. This is the promised seed. And then they fall. And they usually fall quite low. Often shamefully low. We have been making this mistake as human beings since the beginning of time. There is like this obsession with lifting up a person as a savior of the people. We still just do this today. I mean, goodness, it's almost like every, in my, you know, long life of 26 years, even in this, I've, I've noticed that like it's almost every election cycle. People are like, this is the, this is the most critical election. This is it, right? And... It, it, people think that it, with the electing of a president, our nation like rises or falls, right? Um, which, given our governmental system, that, that shouldn't even be an issue. But it's, it's that thing, it's that idea that like, we, we can put people in certain positions of authority or influences in our life, and therefore everything will be good. But we forget that these are fallen, sinful People just like us, right? So even Israel did this, right? Israel had God in their midst. Like he was, he was there, either in the tabernacle or later in the temple. And what did they want? They wanted a king, right? They wanted a physical man to rule over them. It could be a religious figure, a political figure, a philosopher. Goodness, it could be scientists. Right? What do we hear all the time today? The scientific consensus on such and such is that we need to do this or that, right? or we're all going to die in 12 years. It's the same idea. We've propped up men or groups of men and women as a savior of mankind, a savior of humanity. The reality is all of these people cannot save They are still ultimately, like all of us, they are mere men. They are sinners in need of a Savior. And so as great as Noah was, and as righteous as the Scriptures describe him, he still sinned. He still fell, and he fell pretty hard. This is a pretty shameful thing, especially to be discovered by your kids this way. 
But even though man can't save, this is what's important. The God-man, Jesus Christ alone, can save. So the good news of Jesus, the gospel, this is what actually restores relationships. This is what gives a foundation for ethics and morals on which a society can even be built or sustained. Here's, here's the problem. If we look outside the gospel, or we look outside its implications on how to structure our lives and the world around us, our efforts will be futile. And we see this all throughout history. We see it right now. People are constantly trying to figure out what do we do with the problems in this world. And they're looking everywhere but the actual solution that takes care of the heart of man. The gospel, it transforms man, it saves man, it points man to Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is a, an interesting uh, a commentary of sorts on this phenomenon that, that we enter into as people. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and let's look at verses 20 through 31 briefly. I want you to notice some things here. Starting in verse 20. Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back here. Um, let's start in verse 18. Chapter 1, 1 Corinthians. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is he who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, the world, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards, Not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So notice in verse 20 here, the wisdom of the world is what? It's foolish. Why? Why is the wisdom of the world foolish? And think about Let's keep the context here back in Genesis. Think about Noah, especially when he's building the ark around all these people. And the fact that what Noah was telling them was foolishness to them. Why? Well, ultimately, the wisdom of the world is foolishness because it doesn't have a foundation by which to even make sense of reality. For example, you cannot say, We are just the results of random evolutionary processes and then turn around and also say that it's wrong to murder somebody. If if we really are just material, as, as Carl Sagan would say, if we really are just stardust, higher evolved stardust, then what is wrong with one bag of higher evolved material and cells bumping into another one and causing these cells to stop existing. What is wrong with that? There's there's no way to build an idea of morality on that. 
And so the wisdom of the world is foolish because it doesn't even make sense of the reality we live in. You remove God from reality, from trying to understand reality, everything you say and do and think is reduced to absurdity. And what if Noah would have listened to the wisdom of man? If he would have listened to them, him and his family would have drowned. The flood would have came. There would have been no ark. And they would have been swept away with everybody else. But what does verse 27 say here in 1 Corinthians? God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the strong. So that, verse 28, no human being might boast in the presence of God. So that, verse 29, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So Noah may have led the construction of the ark. He may have been a preacher of righteousness. He and described as righteous, but he was still a man. And we see him here coming back to Genesis 9. We see him here in his foolishness. Yet still God used him. Why? Because any boasting was to be in the Lord. Because God alone saves. Noah's family may have been saved physically from the waters of the flood because Noah uh, commanded and, and oversaw the construction of the ark but Noah could not save them from their sins. And you cannot save yourself from your sins. The God-man, Christ Jesus, is the only one who can save you from your sins. Why? Because He dies in our place, right? He takes our sin, even though He knew no sin, so that we might be the righteousness of God. He offers salvation to us by grace through faith alone, right? And so secondly, what I want us to see here in Genesis chapter 9 is that sin has consequences. It's one thing to be saved eternally from your sins. Praise God. But brothers, sisters, we still have a lifetime to live here on this earth. And sin has consequences. Look at this, verse 22, going back to Genesis 9. It says, And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. And then look at verse 24. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. So, before I talk about some lessons, some practical things about the consequences of sin for us, I want to talk about this. What exactly did Ham do wrong? Okay, so the text is is not explicit. But... There are some thoughts on on this. Let's consider some of them. First, whatever Ham did, it dishonored and humiliated his father. And he also sought to make his brother a part of that humiliation. The text says, telling his two brothers outside. His brothers had the right response, though, right? They respectfully, by walking backward and not observing their father in his shame, did not bring further humiliation. And so some things to note here. Nakedness is a sacred thing. And it's shameful when displayed inappropriately. The question is, well, when, when is it appropriate? Well, it's appropriate between you and your spouse only, and when you are alone together, right? Otherwise, it's a good rule, keep your clothes on, okay? You would think this is kind of common sense, but obviously in our society today, it's like people are just walking around in wind tunnels or shredders or something, and it's just pulling off their clothes everywhere they go. But needless to say, the, the revealing of somebody apart from clothing, is a sacred thing. And it's reserved for 
a special relationship, right? And so secondly here, honoring your parents is important. What Ham did was not honoring to his parents. Okay, your parents aren't perfect, obviously. Ham's wasn't, right? I mean, if your father's laying drunk, naked in his tent, you know, that's, and you're seeing that as a, as a son, might be a traumatic experience, right? But that did not give him the right to shame his father. The Bible tells us how to deal with open sin among fellow believers and family members. And, and running around telling others, even close family members, is not the way to do it. Proverbs 17, verse 9 says, Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. So how much more for a father, right? Of course, and this is where it gets really practical here, if someone is not a member of a local church, and even worse, if that church doesn't biblically discipline sin together, then how do they deal with sin? Well, someone that is an open sin usually just gets shamed out of the church. They go to the next one down the road, right? So we want to deal with sin appropriately. It's not our aim to be like him and to bring an open reproach and shame to the person and publicly drag out their garbage. There's a process we go through, right? We approach them as individuals, right? If they do not listen, we approach them with two or three others as as loving brothers and sisters in Christ. And if they don't listen to them, what do we do? We take it to the church. So then let's talk about some lessons for us here. So often people seek counsel because they are trying to pick up the pieces of a life they have already shattered by sin. Let me say that again. Oftentimes people are trying to seek counsel, but often it's too late. Because really what they're trying to do is they're trying to pick up all the pieces that are on the ground of the life they've shattered because of sin. And it's a sobering, it's a hard reality that often the best counsel was to never engage in that sin that brought them where they are in the first place. That's a hard thing to level with some people. You know, they're looking at you, they're pouring their heart out, they realize they've really messed up. They're in a bad spot. And sometimes the reality you know biblically is they are simply suffering the consequences of their sins. And really the only advice at that point is to turn to God in sackcloth and ashes, right? To have remorse over their sin and walk through those consequences. And not do them again And to counsel them, to counsel others, not to repeat their same errors. But what do these people often want? They want a magic wand in that moment to fix it. Right? So one of the lessons here, sin has grave and long-lasting consequences. So Moses is writing this text right before the Israelites are to conquer the land of Canaan. So this took place many hundreds of years before Moses wrote it. But it's not just a coincidence that he kind of drives this about where the Canaanites came from, who their father was, and what got them into the mess that they are in as a people group. He provides right here the basis for why the Canaanites were such a perverse and wicked people that were to be destroyed. But here's a question. Why Canaan and his descendants and not just him? 
Isn't Ham the one that actually did the sin? He's the one that brought shame upon his father. Why his son? Well, this is a difficult question because the text doesn't tell us. It's not explicit. But let, let me give some ideas here, some thoughts on why. First is this, that Noah may have refused to curse Ham since God had already blessed Ham at the beginning of the chapter in verse 1. It says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. It's a possibility. Or possibly Noah could see that Canaan possessed the same attitude and nature as his father. Or even thirdly, a suggestion is that possibly Canaan could have been a part of the shameful acts of his father as well. We just can't really know, though. Those are, those are speculations. But what is clear, though, is that sin doesn't always just affect you. It affects those around you also, especially your children. Parents, your sinful, selfish choices can have horrific impacts on the lives of your children. We've got to be aware of this. We've got to think through this. this. This has got to be one of the things that we are taking time every day as we're reading God's Word to stop and pause and think. Am I about to enter into something? Am I entertaining the idea of entering into something that could have disastrous effects, not only for myself but my family? Because sin has consequences. And we've got to make these decisions in life, major life decisions. We've got to make them by seeking the counsel of God's Word and the counsel of other mature believers. And those of us with parents that have messed up, I know this is a touchy subject, but brothers, sisters, their failure is not an excuse for you to continue in sin. Your parents' failure is not an excuse to wallow in self-pity. Say, oh, woe is me, woe is me. You know, my life would be so much better. Or I could be like this person. Or it's just not fair because my parents did such and such. Or they treated me this way. Those things might be true, and your parents' sins are very real. But be like Shem and Japheth, the other two brothers. Their father's sin did not lead to them sinning as well. Rather, what did they do? They covered their father and they respected him. What did Ham do? He heaped sin on top of his father's sin. And we can see the result of that. So let me address something real quick here that often comes up when people look at this passage. And that's the idea of this of generational curses. Okay? This gets tossed around a lot, mainly by um, kind of prosperity, gospel-focused churches, and more of your, your charismatic groups will use this term generational curse. And they'll look to this and they'll say, look. Everyone after this, all of Canaan's generation were under this generational curse. And sometimes they'll, somebody will come to them and they'll be like, my life's in shambles. I don't know what I did. I didn't do anything. I've always been nice to people. I've been trying my hardest, but I just can't do better. I must be under some kind of generational curse. And they'll use that as an excuse, right? But I want to be clear here. Don't think that Ham's son Canaan being cursed is some idea of a generational curse in the sense that gets presented today by these word of faith and prosperity teachers. They present it as like there's this curse put on you or your family that can't be broken. And let me just be clear here. The idea of being tied down to a generational curse, it's mystical, 
nonsense and it's foolishness. And let me be real frank here. It's, it's just an excuse for laziness and sinful living is what it is. If you are a Christian, if you're not a Christian, there is a very real sense in which you are under a curse. I mean, that's just the reality. And not in a generational sense. Well, we can say, I'm not going to get into that. I mean, you could say, yeah, Adam's our representative, all of that stuff. But not in, not in the sense that these prosperity teachers and word of faith are trying to push it. Because if you are a Christian, Scripture is clear. Galatians 3.13, what? That Jesus did what? He became a curse for us. There is no curse or anything like that to hold you down. If you know Jesus, He has taken any curse that could have been on you or against you. And even for the Canaanites, salvation was offered. Think of this. Rahab, in the story of the Israelites taking Jericho, right? Rahab was a Canaanite living in Jericho. And she was saved by faith. Hebrews 11, 31, yeah, Hebrews eleven thirty one 31 tells us that. She's in the hall of, of faith right there with all these other guys. So even her among all of these Canaanites, this cursed race, there was still salvation there. And this is really hard to hear, okay? But it's sobering, but it's hard. You are responsible for your own outcome in life. Especially in 21st century America. All right, if you're if you were a slave in the 1820s, okay, a little, little bit difficult to be in control of the outcome of your life, right? If you're a slave in the Roman Empire, or if you're in a certain social class, right? But with the rise of Western civilization now, and the way that our economic structure is built, no one is holding you back. Literally anything is at the tip of your fingers. You know, on this little device called a, a smartphone. You can access any information, any financial advice. You can access bank accounts. Anything you need to do and operate your life is right there at your fingertips. And if you are responsible with your time, with your finances, and with major life choices, you can be greatly successful in, de- in today's world. But, covering your parents' sin with more sin will only lead to more disparity. Okay? To sit there and wallow in this idea that you might be under some generational curse or to bring open shame to your parents, to not approach the sin of your parents biblically, as the other two brothers did. And even worse, to repeat the sins of your fathers, as the Canaanites would do grossly. It only leads to more disparity. right? And the legacy of the Canaanites is clear on this. They just go down and down and down. Point number three, and we'll, we'll finish with this. The bigger picture, right? How does this connect to the biblical narrative? Well, this section of Scripture here, verses 18 through 29 of chapter 9, it, it serves as a conclusion to the flood narrative. And it's a transition into the rest of redemptive history. And so I want you to think about this. Always remember, as you're reading God's word, it's part of a bigger picture. There's a lot more going on than just 
what you're reading in those couple of sentences. All right, this is, this is why one of the f- most foolish things you could ever do is to do this whole number. What, what people, they feel like they're so, so pious and so holy. They'll get up in the morning, they'll be like, Lord, I just want you to speak to me. And I'll go like this, and I'll go, oh. and they'll read, right? And what does it say? They're like, oh, it says he hanged himself. Judas hanged himself. Oh. What are you trying to tell me, Lord? And then they'll go through again. They'll open it up again. And they'll read, what you do, go and do quickly. What? <laughs> Obviously, that's, I don't know if that's actually happened to somebody, but it definitely could, right? It's a foolish thing, brothers and sisters, to just open God's word and just blatantly read it with no understanding what's going on, the context, and the big picture. It's part of a bigger picture in the particular passage you're reading, right? Everything we just read had direct connections to the flood. It has direct connections to what David is going to be talking about next week. It also has direct connections to the whole book of Genesis, the narrative, the narrative of Genesis. We'll look at those in just a sec. And also, and this is so crucial What's the big picture of the Bible? And how is what I'm reading fit into it? If you don't know what you're reading, if you don't know how it fits into the big picture of the Bible, then you either need to keep reading or reread carefully. And if you try to understand a portion of Scripture apart from that, apart from the big picture, you will often miss what God's saying. So what's the big picture here? Well, one is Canaan and his descendants were cursed, right? But what about God's promise to provide an offspring from Eve that would strike the serpent's head? If somebody was reading through Genesis carefully, this this would come to their mind, as it should have whenever Cain killed Abel. One of the first things they probably should have thought is like, wait a minute, God promised an offspring from Eve. And Cain just killed Abel. Is is this person that's going to bruise the serpent's head, is he coming from Cain? Right? And then what does the narrative do? Presents another son. Same here. Well, oh my goodness. This entire line of one of Noah's children is curse. Is, Is the Messiah coming from this line? Well, what does the text tell us? At the end, it talks about how the line of Shem is preserved and will provide the genealogical line within what? It leads to Abraham in the book of Genesis, which will then what? As you walk through the whole rest of the Old Testament, it leads to Christ. It leads to Christ, who is the God-man, and he's the Savior, of all his people. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this evening that you've blessed us with, God, that we don't deserve. Lord, I pray that we can heed the counsel of your word. We take it to our hearts. We let it mold us and shape us, push us, Lord, to be more like your son. Lord, we ask this in your son's name. Amen.